Coming up, is the United States about to get a Space Corps? Great red spot! I've flown in all the way from Australia to have an interview with science communicator Athena Brunsberger. All that and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Tomorrow for Orbit 10.25, today July 15th, 2017. My name is Lisa, I've got a Jared, a Mike and a Dada behind me. But before we get started today, I would like to give a huge shout out to our Patreon supporters. Specifically our Escape Velocity patrons. These people give us $10 or more per episode and they get access to our exclusive Discord channel and their name in the show. If you'd like to contribute to the shows of tomorrow too, then head over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now, we have we, Lisa here. Oh we, my we've goodness. got a Look Lisa. Who's here. I'm here. I came Look all the way here. from Australia just so I could do the show for all of you. But I think uh, it's good to have me here. But I think we always start the show off with some launches. So, mm -hmm. Mike, Isn't were there any launches in the last two weeks? Because we did have a week off last yes, week. Yes, there well. was. Yes, there was. We had, of course, that week off, but there have been a couple. So, uh, let's get to the first one in chronological order. This was a Chinese launch of their Long March 5. So, let's go ahead and check out the footage of that. Now this was the second time they've ever launched this rocket, their largest rocket in service to date, the Long March 5. And this launch occurred on Sunday, July 2nd at 1123 Coordinated Universal Time from the Wencheng Space Center on Hainan Island. But it immediately suffered anomalies that led to the failure of the mission. Now the payload for this mission was a large experimental commsat called Shijian 18 that would have been placed into a geostationary orbit. But the liquid boosters separated on schedule, but the core stage of the Long March 5, which you just saw separate on screen, separated over a minute late, and the upper stage was supposed to fire its engines twice in order to place the payload into a correct orbit, but it only fired the engines once. And as far as we know, it seems that the upper stage and payload were destroyed upon re-entry. But in a little bit of good news, China's last launch prior to that, what you're seeing on screen right now, is Chinasat 9A, which also had an anomaly being placed into a wrong orbit, and that has used its own thrusters to uh, get into the proper geostationary orbit it was supposed to. So even though China's last two launches have had uh, quite a few problems, at least one of them has been able to be salvaged. But the CGON 18 has already re-entered and been destroyed in uh, Earth's atmosphere. So a little bit of bad luck for the Chinese. I'm sure that's going to set things back, especially since the Long March 5 is a new type of, of rocket, a new type of fuel that they don't have as much experience with. So hopefully they'll be able to recover quickly from that. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I've been getting so excited for China in these last few years, and to have them have an anomaly was kind of a bummer, but, I mean, I'm sure they'll yeah. recover. I, they'll be fine. I'm sure they will. I'm yeah. sure they will, yeah. And especially with this rocket, I mean, they're planning on using this rocket to launch their large space station modules and to enable whatever type of lunar plans they have, especially their sample return mission, their next uh, lunar mission. So they have to get that one working if they want to continue with those missions. So I hope they will, and I'm sure they will. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. But in any case, there was more launches uh, over these past two weeks. So let's go ahead and get to the next one, which was a uh, SpaceX launch, the third launch that they did in 12 days. So let's go ahead and check out the footage of them launching Intelsat 35. Five, four, three, two, one. Repetition. 
SpaceX launched this Falcon 9 on Wednesday, July 5th at 2338 Coordinated Universal Time from Launch Complex 39A in Cape Canaveral, Florida. And Intelsat 35E is the heaviest payload ever lofted into geostationary orbit by a Falcon 9. So it was the expendable version of the rocket. There were no fins or landing legs on the first stage, and they did not at attempt to have a recovery of the first stage. But this new uh, satellite, the 30 Intelsat 35E, is part of a new series of epic space Craft that are going to give uh, video, voice, and data signals to Africa, Latin America, Atlantic cruise ships, and even parts of Europe and North America. And you, there was just that brief footage of the payload being deployed. So it was a completely successful mission. And again, it was a historic thing to have three launches in 12 days. SpaceX tried to have three launches in nine days, but they had to scrub this mission twice before they were finally able to launch it on Wednesday, July 5th. So congratulations to SpaceX and everyone involved with this and the last two launches prior to this of having all of these uh, strings of successful launches. Just really amazing. It was great to see them do so many launches in uh, such a short period of time, but it was weird seeing that rocket, that last one, with like no landing <laughs> stuff. Like um, Space yeah. Cookie in the chat was saying, naked falcons just look so wrong, and I agree. Like we're just so used to seeing them be ready to come back to Earth that when they don't, it just looks weird. But they, that's that's normal for like every other rocket in the industry, right? They didn't even try to land. I know. Amateurs. I know. How dare they? Like, we're just so used to it now. <laughs> Oh, but, uh, what an amazing of, thing to be able to say. Speaking yeah. of new uh, rockets launching lots and lots of things, wasn't there a rocket that launched with lots and lots of CubeSats on board, Mike? Oh yeah, absolutely. This was uh, 73 launches. Not not quite as uh, uh, much as, as this country's record has had before, but Russia launched a Soyuz 2-1A rocket that, as we said, launched 73 satellites. So let's go ahead and check out the footage That's of that, and then we'll talk about what some of those are. Looks like the uh, audio was a little muted on that. But in any case, this rocket launched on Friday, July 14th at 6.36 Coordinated Universal Time from launch pad number 31 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, which pretty much means that Soyuz operations from Baikonur are pretty much uh, under normal operations again. The primary payload for this mission was Canopus V-IK. It's a Russian spacecraft designed to locate forest fires and uh, have other uh, um, geological data that it would be able to have. But for the other 72 small satellites, there were 48 CubeSats for Planet's Global Earth Observation Fleet that they have. These were their Dove satellites that they've been building. I really like the Dove satellites because they have a lot of really nice artwork on the backside of the solar panels. But uh, on top of that, there was eight Lemur CubeSats for uh, Spire Global's we uh, communication, or rather commercial weather network, not a communication network, and also their competitor, GeoOptics, had three Cicero weather CubeSats on this launch as well. I found that really interesting. There were also three other CubeSats from uh, uh, California-based companies. There was two student-built German satellites, two Norwegian maritime tracking and communication satellites, a uh, microsatellite from uh, Japan to map Arctic sea ice, as well as two Earth imaging CubeSats for Rose Cosmos and three nanosatellites developed by Russian universities. So this, all of this was apparently a successful launch, and this happened just yesterday on Friday. And uh, everything went well with that. So I'm happy to see them being competitive and allowing more commercial launches to, uh, to take place, especially two competitors on the same launch. I found that really interesting. So congratulations to Rose Cosmos and everyone who made this possible. Yeah, I think it was cool that there's all different uh countries building all these satellites that Russia's taking up. It's cool to see all different countries that can't launch by themselves jumping together and, and ride sharing on something like that, which is that's pretty awesome. Yeah. But uh Absolutely. Jared, this next story uh is something that you found pretty beautiful and I know oh, because yes. uh, when Jared first saw the pictures from this next story, we're in the line at Disney and uh he his face just lights up and I'm like, Jared, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> And uh, he told me that uh, something came from space that he found pretty beautiful. Yes, what did so you see? straight from the outer solar system, uh, from one of my favorite missions, Juno, which has currently uh, just celebrated its first year in orbit around Jupiter, because it went into orbit on July 4th, 2016. Uh, so, you know, pretty, pretty, how American is that, that we put it in, uh, in orbit on Independence Day uh, for us. But it, uh, it uh, put a... It, it took images of the Great Red Spot on its latest dive down towards Jupiter on what we call Perigeo 7. And this is the imagery uh, that has come back from it. Now, 
The Great Red Spot was first confirmed in 1830, but it could have been a storm noted in observations as early as 1665. Uh, it's a 16,000-kilometer-wide anticyclone with winds up to 600 kilometers an hour in it. So uh, that's a basic, that's a big old storm with really fast winds. Uh, now Juno skimmed over the cloud tops of the Great Red Spot at, uh, at 12.55 in the morning UTC on July 11th. It was just 8,000 kilometers above those cloud tops traveling at 180,000 kilometers an hour. Just a tremendous amount of speed. Now these are the most detailed images that we've ever had of the Great Red Spot, and it should aid in understanding what drives the Great Red Spot. Uh, now, Juno has a instrument on board called the Microwave Radiometer, which can detect down to about 540 kilometers below the cloud tops. And this is going to reveal to us just how deep the Great Red Spot is, and from that we may actually be able to determine uh, what drives the Great Red Spot, the composition and other things like that. Uh, so this is really, really exciting uh, that we were able to get this absolutely beautiful imagery um, there, uh, post-processing by Sean Doran, uh, who has been doing a, an amazing job um, because Juno, the Juno uh, mission puts all of this out to the public for them to work with. Uh, and Sean Doran has definitely been one of those people that's been leading uh, the, the enhancement and the beauty of uh, getting the, this raw imagery uh, looking like what it actually should look like. And very helpful to scientists too. Uh, so a lot of great citizen science happening, happening on uh, this, uh, this <laughs> mission. It is just breathtaking. I, I can't speak because it's just such amazing imagery coming back from it. And it just goes to show how important it is to have a camera on a spacecraft because mm -hmm. Juno wasn't going to have a camera. No, it wasn't. And we wouldn't be seeing all these amazing images that people can really connect with mm -hmm. around the world if yeah. we didn't have that camera. So every mission needs to have a camera for public outreach. Like, I can't stress that enough. Like, yeah. Juno was an example of that. Hashtag cameras for spacecraft. So put a camera <laughs> on it. That's like, it should be the number one priority on your instrument list. So. Every single one. Put yeah. a camera on it. Hey, like one, camera, so, done. Yes. That's all you need. Got it. That's all we, who needs like mass spectrometers and other things? Just put a camera on it. Right? So, we don't yeah. need to please the scientists. We just need to please the no, public, right? Exactly. I mean, they're the ones paying for it. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, somebody asked in the chat room um, how many Earths uh, the Great Red Spot is. It's right now about one and a quarter Earths in size. Roughly, it, it's actually been shrinking over the past couple of decades, oh, wow. uh, and we don't know why. So maybe this pass will help us to explain why it's been getting smaller. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, this next Very story is a little bit U.S. centric, so you're going to have to explain it to me because I spend a lot of time in Australia. <laughs> we don't have a space agency, let alone this next piece of news that you're going to tell us about. So <laughs> fill me in, Mike. So um, there are some representatives within the American House of Representatives, one of the official branches of government, who want to create a new branch of the American military. They want to create the Space Corps. And uh, this proposal has kind of come with a little bit of backlash, but there's some things about it that m may or may not make sense, depending on who you are from an operational standpoint. But in any case, uh, there's uh, Representative Rogers, who is on the House Armed Services Committee. That's a committee that helps decide what the budget is for the American military and for national defense projects. And what Mike Rogers has done, he's a, a Republican from Alabama. Him and Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee, have proposed this legislation in the entire 2018 budget for the, the, the entire U.S. government for next year, which includes NASA's budget. And what they're proposing is to take away all of this, the, the space functions from the Air Force and have that be a new branch that has the same type of relationship that the Marine Corps does to the Navy, the same type of way that um, on, on old, old uh, Navy ships there would always be a contingent of some sort of army that was separate from that Navy, regardless of, of whether that's the United States or Britain or, or whatever country. That, that's, that's pretty standard. But in any case, uh, they would want this to be a new law by January 1st, 2019, and they would report directly to the new Air Force Secretary, Secretary Heather Wilson. Now, the Air Force Chief of Staff, General David Goldfine, and there's a picture of these Chiefs of Staff here. He's a, uh, G General Goldfine is on the right, and the new uh, 
Air Force Secretary Heather Wilson on the left, they oppose this because they believe that they were to reorganize and create this new branch right now, not only would that be a huge increase of cost, but it would add complexity to an all-rated complicated program, and it could put a lot of programs at risk, like the GPS programs, and have interruptions in lots of services that the, the, the Space Corps within the Air Force already does. But even the Trump administration is opposed to the idea, stating that they need more time to look at the options. And there's other members of the Air Force and, and other uh, uh, high-ranking officials, there's only one member that has really gotten support for this idea, and it, his whole caveat is to have both the space programs of the Navy and the Army fall under this new Space Corps, so that all space activities are done under the Space Corps. Now, even though that this might sound like a bad idea, the main reason that these representatives are proposing this is because the Air Force doesn't have enough funds to keep up with the programs, and there's no incentives for any of the, the, the people involved with it to get promotions, and there's just a, a horrible lack of funding to have these programs continue. And they also cited that Russia and China both already have their own independent space corps that may or may not answer to one of the other branches of government, but at least have its own separate organizational structure. And whether or not you guys think that this might be a bad idea, it still kind of sounds cool. And if it were to become a reality, I think I would enlist, but at the <laughs> same time, we just don't need, we just don't need all of this extra complexity and more money and just all, all, all of the problems to create all of this and what sort of interruptions might happen in, in, in the interim. So <laughs> this is something I'm going to be following closely and any time that there's a major update on this, we'll talk about this and whether or not this actually becomes law or not, we'll see, especially in the coming weeks and months. But I at least wanted to talk about it. Yeah, I, mean, I hope I that guess... made sense. Oh yeah, totally, Mike. But um, I don't know how I feel about you know getting more military type involvement in space. It doesn't really sit right with me. But I guess I don't know. Maybe it's going to help you guys in the United States protect your space assets and your access to space. Uh, I guess we'll have to. I, I I've just thought that the Air Force, uh, the Navy, and the National Reconnaissance Office have been doing a pretty good job managing things themselves. So it's it was really surprising to hear about something like this pop up. So. Yeah. yeah. Well. That was a story about something getting bigger in the military, but I think, Jared, you want to talk about something that's really, really small, right? Yes, yes. In honor of you being here, um, we're going <laughs> to <Yeah>. talk <laughs> about a very cool, uh, <laughs> very interesting... That was not a burn. Oh, my gosh. It's true. Um, so we're going to talk about... Thanks, Jared. Um, you're welcome. Uh, there's a very interesting... There's a very cool... Uh, uh, telescope called the Wide Angle Search for Planets, um, or also abbreviated WASP. And it's a robotic telescope array that's designed to look for exoplanets that transit or move in front of their star. You see the dip in the light and you're able to determine, okay, there's a planet doing that. Well, it has found something so small that it's the smallest of its kind that we know of, and it's not an exoplanet, it's actually a star. And they're currently calling the star EBLMJ0555-57 AB. Um, again, we're very good at naming things as scientists. <laughs> um, and it's about 600 light years away from Earth, and it is very, very small. Um, now, a star is officially de de defined as an object with sustained nuclear fusion occurring in its core. So your core has to be at uh, very high temperatures in order to sustain nuclear fusion. And this star, EBLM, is about 1 20th the mass of our own sun and just slightly bigger than Saturn. Um, now, it was discovered by the transit method as it orbited another star, as EBLM is in a binary star system. And WASP was able to take very precise measurements of the movement of the larger star in that binary system. And due to the gravitational influence of EBLM orbiting around it, and they were able to determine the mass of EBLM. And it's literally right at the threshold between brown dwarf and star. So if EBLM had been a fraction smaller in mass, it would not be able to perform nucle nuclear fusion at its core, and it wouldn't be considered a star. So stars of this size, they're really difficult to study, simply because they are so small, they're darn near impossible to detect. So actually detecting EB EBLM will help us improve stellar searches in the future and maybe understand uh, stellar physics as well a little bit better. So a uh, very, very interesting uh, study and result from that, uh, from a telescope that wasn't designed to do that. So. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jared. Um, mm -hmm. I think stars are really cool. There was someone in the chat room that said, if 
going by that definition, if we were able to get fusion going in a jar, mm -hmm. would we have a star in a jar? Maybe. That'd be pretty Star cool. in a jar. That'd be a good Christmas On the present. shelf? Yeah. yeah. That sort of like thing, interesting... this, just, this just muddies planetary definitions for me. So does that <gasps> yeah. mean the no, nuclear... Uh, uh, because they don't have nuclear fission, Jupiter and Saturn are just failed stars? Well, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that argument a lot, but they're really not massive enough to, to even consider them. They're more like failed brown dwarfs. Yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> cool stuff, though. <laughs> All right, Mike. I think we've got a lightning round coming up now. So, uh, that's right. Lightning there's round. Take it away. Ready? Go. Over the... oh, there's a lot of stuff that's happened over the past two weeks, and I just want to talk about all of them. Ready? Go. Let's play the video. Mm. So Canada has selected two new astronauts, Joshua Kerchick, a test pilot, and Dr. Jennifer City, an engineer and a professor. And that's really cool. They're going to be joining the new class of American astronauts. Britain will most likely remain part of the European Galileo Navigation Satellite Program because a British company, Surrey Satellite Technology, has received a new contract to supply parts for more Galileo satellites. That's awesome. JAXA, meanwhile, has been testing engines for their next generation rocket, the H3. It's going to replace the H2. And and it's going to be able to enable a lot of their recently announced plans to send missions to the moon in the 2030s, both robotic and human, although there is a lack of details about how exactly they would be sending humans to the moon with this rocket. Meanwhile, bad news, x -Corps Aerospace has apparently lost its contract to build co engines for United Launch Alliance's ACES upper stage for the Vulcan rocket. And since, they, since then, x -Corps Aerospace has had to lay off pretty much all of their employees except for a small handful to try to get support for their Lynx space plane. Ugh. I'm really rooting for them, though. I'm really hoping they can bounce back. Meanwhile, SpaceX's Dragon capsule for the CRS-11 cargo mission to the International Space Station has departed and returned to Earth on July 3rd. So that was really awesome. And this was the, the first time that they reused a Dragon capsule as well. So another successful mission for that Dragon. That's, that's, that's just awesome. And finally... We have to talk about it. The Trump administration has reactivated the National Space Council. And the National Space Council's goal, or their purpose, is to advise the president on space policy. Members of the council are still being picked and decided. It's going to be headed by Mike Pence. And no detailed plans or policies have been announced so far and may not materialize for two years. In the meantime, though, NASA is pushing ahead with their Deep Space Gateway plans, and it looks like all of our international partners are getting more and more involved. And I have a suspicion that that's what JAXA's plans involve in order to get to the moon. So that is what I thought was most interesting over the past two weeks. Mike, that was like 20 stories in one good job. That was fantastic. <laughs> you covered like everything in like such a small amount of time, and yet you did it so well. That was awesome. I want to talk about all those things in much greater detail, but we just don't have the time. Yeah. Maybe in After Dark, we might have a chat about it. Yeah. Maybe so. Maybe yeah, maybe so. so. Yeah. I'd love to talk about any of them in After Dark. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But we have uh, one last uh, really cool thing here. One yeah. more story, Jared. What have you got for us? Yeah, so the theme seems to be uh, stars, failed stars, uh, uh, washed up stars uh, during the show today. So uh, we're going to hit it off with just one more, uh, which is the leftovers of a star. Um, now, the, a supernova known as 1987A, uh, which occurred, you guessed it, in 1987, specifically February 24th, um, they began to study the remnants uh, of it in great detail. Uh, now, it's located 168,000 light years away from us in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a small irregular galaxy that orbits uh, the Milky Way in our local Group. Is that the little fuzzy thing you can see, like when you look in the night sky and you see the Milky Way there? It's one of the fuzzy You can holes? see it. You oh. can see it because you're from the southern hemisphere. Oh. I, uh, all of us in the northern hemisphere, we can't see it. Oh, it's pretty cool. So, lucky you. Yeah, it's yeah. You get to see the large and the small Magellanic clouds. Yeah, they're little so. fuzzy dots. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, lucky. All right, so um, <laughs> it's, a, it's actually no. this supernova was the closest to occur to Earth since 1604. And actually, if you were around in 1987 and in the southern hemisphere, uh, it was naked eye visible in dark skies. Um, now, it's been studied in immense detail ever since. This is a Hubble image uh, of it right here, and it kind of looks like there's two rings around it, um, but they are not around it um, in the horizontal plane, if you will. They are vertically above it um, here, and there's a really cool video that we'll get to in a second that will show you the structure uh, of it here. Now, the Atacama Large Submillimeter Array, ALMA, uh, which uh, looks in microwave, was used to view the remnants and found several previously undetected chemical species there, such as silicon monoxide, 
monoxide, sulfur monoxide, and carbon monoxide. Now there's a, been a very long held assumption that a supernova is energetic enough that it destroys complex chemical species, such as what was discovered. So, back to the modeling they go. We got to go back to the drawing board, as we often do in science, and figure out what we need to work on. Uh, and see how we can model those, uh, those chemical species coming out of a supernova explosion like that. So, a uh, very nice result, nice surprising result, uh, as we often like, making us rethink what supernovae actually make. So... That's the cool Very thing cool about stuff. science. Like, even though, even if our model is wrong and we get data that contradicts it, we can make the models better and better and better exactly. like, each time we go. So in yeah. science, it's okay to get things wrong. Yeah, That's absolutely. Good. In fact, getting things wrong can lead to more interesting things, like what we have in this case. It's right encouraged. Here. So yeah. Yeah, it's well, very cool. <laughs> well, that's all the news we have for you today. But speaking of science, in just a bit after our short break that we're going to have, I'll be doing an interview with Athena Brensberger, a space science communicator. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Now, if you thought landing on the moon was great, wait till you hear about what we did on Skylab. Skylab 2, we fix anything, we got a pitch and a roll program. Skylab is the first time that orbit becomes a destination. Also, it completely rewrote the book on solar physics. Skylab on its own changed the way we live on this planet. This was a new, a whole new frontier. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview with Astro Athens, I'd love to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow. So. Thank you to our Escape Velocity patrons who give us $10 or more per episode. They get access to our exclusive Discord channel and their name in the show. We also have our Orbital subscribers which give us $5 or more per episode and they get access to free worldwide swag sh store shipping and their name in the show as well. So if you'd like, like to help us out and support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. So we have Athena here today, lovely to have you on the show. Yeah, super excited to be here. Yeah, so you're a science communicator, that's what I do as well. My background is in science communication and uh, we just want to have a little bit of a chat with you today about what you do and yeah. uh, why. So you talk to people about science. Yeah. Why? Why do you talk to people about science? Because uh, I was really inspired when I was a lot younger. Uh, my high school actually had a planetarium, which was really cool. Yeah, I learned how to track asteroids on these old giant bulky computers, which is really cool. Um, and I really was like, I just want to tell all my friends about this and my family. That translated into the years. And then I was in college, studied astrophysics for a bit, and realized like, whoa, while I was doing research, I wanted to tell literally people on like the subway about it. So I thought, let me try and turn this into something that I could reach a bigger audience. And that, well, what better way than the internet? So it's kind of how it started was through that. I love yeah. that you had a planetarium in your right. high school. I know, like, and it was a random little school in Brooklyn. It was supposed to be like a radio broadcast. It was Edward R. Murrow High School, which is a radio broadcaster, turned into uh, more of like a performing arts school. So we were all kind of music majors, but we also had astronomy, so kind of did both at the same time. <laughs> so it was cool. But instead of going into like uh, the arts and stuff, or radio, like your school was kind of based on, you did science research instead, right? I actually did both. So um, when I was in college, I uh, was a major in physics, but I also was a minor in dance because um, I was a ballet professional ballet dancer for about 15 years. So I did that, and I've always been involved in the arts and theater. So um, in high school, I also was doing that. But I always wanted to do so much more with astrophysics because there's just, you know, you can't really do dance in space, but you can do so much other stuff, like explore and find out what else is out there. So that's why I wanted to pursue astrophysics. And we had um, an observatory on my campus. Uh, out of all the CUNY schools, College of Staten Island had a freaking observatory, <laughs> which I couldn't believe. Um, and so that was really cool. It was the first time I looked through an H-alpha filter to look at sunspots, which was really awesome. And uh, so that really inspired me to try and pursue that. And then that's how I was led into my um, 
NASA space grant to do research on protoplanetary disks and then M-dwarf stars uh, while in college at the Hayden Planetarium. So, and then that's, yeah, that sort of started a journey in itself. Isn't that the planetarium that Neil deGrasse Tyson Yeah, works yeah, he's the director of it. Um, so he actually helped construct all of it. He, it was his idea and his image. Um, and that's where he does a lot of his interviews. It's in his office. Um, and his office is actually where he kind of advised me on what to do with my life because like, he caught me in the middle of kind of like a breakdown being torn between the two worlds of the arts and the sciences. And um, I was advised by him for quite a few weeks that summer. And he really, he was a, actually a competitive dancer also. He was a really big dancer back in his day. Um, and I believe he also trained at Alvin Ailey, which is where I was going for my dance school. And he's like, so I understand wanting to be in both realms. And he's like, but find a way that they tie together and put that out into the world. And so everything I, what I ended up doing was I diverted out of science, went into acting and modeling, took everything I learned from showbiz and I'm trying to turn that now into how can I utilize that into science. So, yeah, and trying to get people that don't know about space and science because people who already know about it are always going to love it. But there's yep. so many people that don't know about it. And especially being in the community I was in, which was more of the fashion industry, get them to really care about it. So I'm really stoked that, like, you know, Chanel, everyone's doing all this space-inspired stuff. I mean, Chanel had a rocket ship go off, like a model rocket at uh, Fashion Week in, in fall. So anyway. Side note, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's that. really relevant because I, I find like a lot of people, they like space, they just don't know that they like space yep. yet. So yep. like reaching those people and making space and especially astrophysics, it's kind of a topic where, you know, it, it's, so, it's so far away, it's so distant, like, and bringing it down and making it relevant to people can really help them realize that they like space. So how, yeah. do, you, how do you do that? Because you make videos and you do blog posts about yeah. space, right? So my video started really randomly. The very first episode I did was on centripetal acceleration, only because Dr. Liu, who was my very first astronomy professor in college, ran into the classroom the first day of school, jumped on the desk and was like, who wants to learn about space? Put a stool on the desk, asked for a volunteer, and started spinning the stool, had her you know, like pull her arms and legs in, and she accelerated that translated to like everyone in the room and I was like wait a second if that one simple thing gets everyone in the room who's like political science majors communicators like all these different majors and they were just taking astronomy because it was mandatory to take a, a science class it made them want to go to the observatory learn about space like want to sign up for like apod.com like newsletters to me that resonated so well that I'm like this is what I need to try and do so that's why I first started my first episode or my first video I guess on YouTube so I had no idea what I was doing I was using my iPad to record it I kept stopping and then I just kept moving from there on and I also was never wanting to do a lot of graphics in my videos so most of the time I'm improving in my videos I'll use whatever's kind of nearby to explain stuff I've done things like on set while I'm like shooting for a commercial or whatever and I have coffee and then I have a blueberry so I explain gravitational waves or I'll use like a napkin and a coffee cup to explain like um, the, the Bose shock radiation on a, a proplet, a protoplanetary disk, just because like people I get that if I get that other people will get that and so to me I'm like that's that's the important thing because if you get more people interested, it's not just a cool subject, but it's about us all as a human race really advancing in it. And at the end of the day, it does a lot of times come down to politics, which is why I ended up going down to, to D.C., is if that if there's more people interested, more people are going to think that the NASA budget should go up, which means in turn there's going to be more funding for research, for students, for you know, rocket launches, for everything. And then the human race is going to be like, I don't know, living on multiple planets. So, yeah. <laughs> it's all about grassroots all the way up to yes. Congress and people in power. And you've, you've been to Congress, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Why um, were you there? That was epic. I um, have been with the Planetary Society just donating monthly for a while, and I saw this email that came through to go to Congress. Um, with uh, It was uh, for the Space Exploration Alliance Legislative Blitz, very long name, for the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017. And I was like, oh, I'd love to sign up for this. I signed up for it. Um, I got accepted. I thought it'd be like hundreds of people. It was only like 70 of us or something. And we had over 180 meetings with different senators and people of Congress. And uh, we're on Capitol Hill. We we're in a team of four people. And we met with a lot of different just representatives, congressmen and women, to talk about the importance of the NASA Transition Authorization Act. And we all were just volunteers. I mean, we weren't like lobbyists. We weren't paid. We literally were just volunteers talking about the importance of it, like flew out on my own. 
Um, don't know why I flew out of New York. I should just take a train, but whatever. Um, <laughs> did that. And in the end of it, we got the act to not only be signed, but it's been, uh, I know like the budget's kind of been all over the place, but a lot of it was increased, which is really awesome. A lot of for, for exploration. So I was really stoked about that. I think this was the first NASA bill, NASA Transition Authorization Act, that was signed um, in about seven years, I believe, is what they were telling us. Um, so that was like really exciting. And through that, that's what kind of led into my spacesuit try on experience with Final Frontier Designs in Brooklyn. Um, I was meeting with uh, a congresswoman from Brooklyn and she, uh, we wanted to do like a lot of research. Yeah, this is the video, <laughs> this is really cool. Uh, we had to do research on how much funding had gone specifically to each state. And so while we were meeting with her, uh, we found out about Final Frontier Design. I was like, oh, let me just like them on Facebook. Got an email from Nicolay, who was like the lead engineer of this and um, of Final Frontier Designs, and he ended up, they won um, a, a NASA Centennial Challenge for their Space Glove technology. So NASA was wow. holding this challenge for whoever can develop the best technology of Space Gloves. And they ended up winning it, and we have a video that'll be coming out soon, but, um, oh yeah, then there's that one too. So I got, they, they then emailed me or messaged me on Facebook, and were like, do you wanna come by and try on our suits and do a video on it? And I'm like, yeah, like that would be so epic. Was it easy to get into this suit? Because it looks like here that you know, you're kind of struggling a little. It actually, it actually wasn't that difficult. Um, it, we couldn't film while getting in just because a lot of it is confidential. Right, um, right. But uh, it, well, I was wearing just kind of like, um, like long johns, like Under Armour type stuff, and I literally just kind of like crawled into it, my legs first, and then just threw it over my shoulders. And then he did all this patching and whatnot and stuff. Um, but then once I got the, the helmet on, which was really interesting because I'm very sensitive with air pressure, changing air pressure, my ears pop like crazy. Um, and I felt that because we were testing out like oxygen levels and pressure yep. levels. So I actually go back every now and then um, to kind of be like their spacesuit model, I guess. Oh, and I like I'm written in like their archive with like all these other names of astronauts. And I'm like, whoa, I'm written with all these people, which is really cool. But um, it was, so this was the intravehicular uh, activity suit. So the IVA spacesuit, which I'm sure everybody knows about. It's the orange one is meant for inside the, yeah. um, the space station. So this one was, was, I think weighed about 15 pounds, where the ones when you'd be doing spacewalks are about 300 pounds. Um, they weigh like a lot more just to make up for the gravity difference. But this one was like really cool. It was actually really easy to move around in. Um, and there also was um, a vacuum we were able to put our hands into and, and play with like a Rubik's Cube and do all this stuff and compare the new space clubs with the older ones. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, those videos will be coming out soon. That's awesome. <laughs> Went back um, a couple times. We've, we've got a question from the chat room here. Yeah. Um, so Neuropilot asks, are those real spacesuits or are they prototypes or are they just demos? Like are they spacesuits that are gonna be used? Yes, this was uh, an actual spacesuit that um, it, the final things that they had to put on it was just the patch that you see on the upper right uh, chest area. Um, there was just a few more things they actually had to add in on there, but this actually was um, a real spacesuit. Um, it's, I think once he finalizes the gloves and everything, he's gonna be sending it off because that's one thing as to why I was kind of saying I was like more like the spacesuit models that they were getting it fit on me because of my, my proportions, my height and everything is uh, I guess more so similar to the male. Yeah, astronauts. we have really different spacesuits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but that was definitely a real, real spacesuit. Yeah, they did have some prototypes, which is really cool. But yeah. So, you you're doing this spacesuit modeling, I guess. But in your <laughs> other day job, you do a lot of modeling that's not related to space at all. So, tell us about that. And and do you try and use your modeling work as a platform for talking about space? Yes, 100%. When I first started it, um, it was, uh, I went right away overseas. Um, so I've traveled, I'm th very grateful. I've been in seven different countries for modeling. And while I was overseas, I always happened to be near a planetarium or observatory, which is really funny. Um, but I was always talking to people about it on set. And that's when I first was kind of being told you should do stuff with, with space. I completely put it on the back burner when I went into to modeling. Um, but I, I loved it because a lot of this stuff, you're completely being put into a character. And to be honest, I like to say that I, I get to still play my inner artist child. So I still have like this little bit of creativity where it's like, unless I'm painting, this kind of gets to fulfill that, which is really great. Um, and 
I never thought those two worlds could be tied together, like ever, until, I mean, stuff like this started being created yeah. and like space stuff. I mean, you see everyone in those like NASA flight jackets now. People are interested in space and, and, fa and just fashion and designers are really taking on to that. So I'm trying to really like get those two worlds to be tied more together. I mean, Nick Graham for the Fall Fashion Week in New York City had Buzz Aldrin and Bill Nye the Science Guy walking in it. And I was, which was really funny. I started following him, liking all the stuff. He started following me and liking my stuff. And I'm like, yo, I'll see you in Fashion Week, hopefully. But it's a, a male, men's line. Anyway, um, but yeah, so I, I do still full-time model. Um, I was thinking I was going to completely kind of scratch that and just full-time try and go into space. But I've realized that I get to such a interesting audience through like the fashion industry and then also like I do still do like a bit of acting and I'm still a dancer and I meet so many people that are getting more involved in space. I mean even Final Frontier Designs, they designed the whole costume um, set for uh, the DC Ballet Company because they were doing, it was called, um, uh, I think it was just called Final Frontier and it was um, a, a, a actual ballet that was on space and they designed the costumes for it. So this, this these two worlds really are merging a lot and I'm, I'm really happy that I could still kind of do that full time. So while I'm out here, I'm doing like a lot of shoots wherever I'm going and then back in New York, um, still working for lots of awesome clients. So like, what not. Yeah. So that's why you're out here, because you're based in New York, right? But you're here in California. Yeah. yeah. So you're here doing some modeling work. Yeah. I actually booked my ticket, had no plans, just was like, I need to go to California. I really want to live here one day, but I'm a Brooklyn girl, born and raised. Uh, but I, I came out here and I had uh, four test shoots, four shoots already. I had two shoots yesterday and then two the day after I landed. Um, so I'm definitely working on that for sure. Um, and yeah, I'm just, there's so many, like, came to be on the show out too, here. So. And I came to be on the show, exactly. It's mixing the art and the science again. So. Exactly, yeah. But it's good. I'm, like, super happy that it's still working. And then also during, like I said, like, I'm excited for uh, the Fall Winter Fashion Week, which is going to be coming up. Well, it's going to be Spring Summer Fashion Week is the one in fall. Um, because there's going to be a lot going on in New York City with uh, just designers that are wanting to do stuff with space which is really cool so I'm excited about that but yeah but I still do that full time I want to go overseas again and go back to like Korea which would be really cool that's like my second home I lived there for a long time and they got a lot of cool space stuff out there and yeah as you guys I'm sure are well aware of but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and you, you're a dancer as well so you, you do yeah. your YouTube videos your blogging and your modeling and dancing as well, right? Because you yeah. do ballet. Yeah. And I saw in one of your videos, you're actually using a point shoe, a ballet point shoe, yes. to describe a science concept. So how do you yes. reach dancers when you want to talk about space? Yeah, well, um, what I love is <clears throat> talking about torque, um, because like dancers understand like the physicality and how you, to really use your body and put it in a certain like angle to actually get a perfect turn, a perfect pirouette. So that's why I did like a really quick video on, on, on torque, um, doing a pirouette. And then I spoke about the, um, the axis of rotation on the actual point shoe because it has like a little wooden block carved out inside. So as far as reaching dancers, I guess I used to train at Broadway Dance Center and then also have an alien in New York City. And while I was out there, I mean, it just making friends, it kind of came up in conversation about the space stuff. And then they took a big interest in it. And they're like, we want to go to these telescopes or wherever you're going to be going. And I mean, Columbia does astronomy outreach. And so we all just literally go to the roof and we look at telescopes. We look at Saturn and like so, so many people that haven't seen Saturn. And I'm like... And it, it changes, it inspires them, and then they end up choreogra like choreographing a dance that's about exploration and love and passion and space. And that like then influences other people and people are like, I want to do this too. And even on, on social media, I, I am so happy to literally get messages or emails from people that are like, you know what, I'm also a dancer and I want, you've inspired me to go into a degree in astrobiology. Like it's, it's crazy that actually is happening. Well, there's lots of mashing up because there's yeah. even like a new dance genre on like space dancing. People go on zero G flights yeah. and they, they perform choreography while they're simulating being in space, like on the zero G aircraft. So, I mean, maybe that's a thing that, yeah. that people are going to get into now and all the stuff that you do with dancing, like, do you think maybe that's kind of the next frontier for dancers is to like I think learn so. how to dance in microgravity and in space? Yeah, I mean they already took a lot of technology into a lot of performances like um, like the, the LED lights and the projections and the silhouette dances um, you could probably see on like um, all those competition shows on TV. But um, I told you they should totally start doing that. It's like zero G gra like like dancing. That'd be 
group. I mean, there's already the aerial yoga or zero gravity yoga with yeah. the silks. Yep. So there's already a lot, especially with like gymnastics and aerobatics um, that, I mean, I have friends that are contortionists and they're doing space stuff and they're covered in like crystals and they're performing at like, I don't know, PhD rooftop in New York. And there's just so much. So I'm sure it's going to start merging even more. Um, I mean, to me, the, the more the merrier, the more people can really want to talk about space, especially with Occupy Mars, like your shirt. I mean, this is, I think that it's, there's a lot of positivity that can be in it. And I think the only time people aren't positive or maybe fearful is just not being fully aware or educated or reading enough about like how much the human race can really can advance by, I don't know, living on more than one planet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that as science communicators, one of the best things we can do is try and get that information out there. But I think sometimes there are people that don't uh, absorb the information. Like, even if you're making yeah. YouTube videos and stuff, I guess if they're not people like that are scientists or come from a non-science background, I guess sometimes they can get a little bit confused. I mean... Uh, tarantula in the chat room, uh, they were asking, how do you attempt to communicate science with people who are not only science illiterate, but also uh, taken in by like pseudoscience as well? So do you ever have yeah. that with any of your YouTube videos? Um, not so much. I mean, I used to, I'm not like super huge on YouTube, I guess so that's probably why. So, um, but I have gotten some people that will question a lot of things. Um, I think that, that I'll be talking about like, like, oh, this image is totally photoshopped. And on one hand, I guess there's nothing really can do about it except for give more information. People will take as they will from things. Yeah. You can't really convince someone unless they're ready to be convinced. So, but as far as like the language and the lingo I use, I use very like basic minimal language. Even when I'm explaining something like the Drake equation, I'm like, this is how many places we can live on. Because I try not to use too much um, I guess just, just too much vocabulary that would yep. confuse people. Um, just because that, I think that is derived from when I was doing research at the Hayden and explaining a proplid, I had to really break down like what certain things were um, to, to kids. And then I work at the, um, I volunteer at the Intrepid in New York City. So I'm always under the space shuttle enterprise and I get tons of kids. And so I try to explain things with like, like I guess comparing things through metaphors or toys or life. And so, and that's kind of, I think, how I try to translate stuff because, I mean, um, especially with pseudoscience stuff, I think that, like I said, it's just, it's kind of giving them as much information as you can, but at the end of the day, people will kind of decide things on their own. It is frustrating, but there's really nothing you can do about it, I think, until, like, enough people come together to really be like, like, you got to believe that we've really been to the moon. you got to believe that this image isn't photoshopped. Like, this is a live stream of the Milky Way galaxy, which we are inside of. Like... And, you know, but if you're forcing things on someone, that all they're going to do is kind of back up even more. Yeah. So that's kind of, I think, how I do it. But like I said, with my videos, I try to, the best way to translate is using a coffee cup or using, like, I don't know, a splash of water. And, and my best way to test that out is my sister's 13 years old. If she gets a lot of these things, then I think a lot of people get it. So that's kind of, in my mind, my target audience is if she understands what I'm saying, a lot of other people will. So that's kind of my tactic, I guess. Uh, You're obviously super <laughs> passionate about talking to people about science, and uh, that it's it's really great to see. I mean, I love talking to people about science too. So it's just like yeah, it's so awesome to hear you talk about how you reach your your 13 year old sister as well. So yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, there are five general questions that we like to ask uh, everyone that comes on the show. There's no right answers to these questions. So okay. just whatever the first thing that comes to your mind is, let us know. And the first question is, moon. Or Mars first? If I was going moon, because I'd want to see the moon first. Okay. Um, and we've been there already, so that's kind of, yeah, moon. That, that leads nicely into the second question, which is, <laughs> would you go? Yes, 100%. <laughs> I think I would too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't pass up any opportunity to go. Uh, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Mm. I would say 2022. It's what I'm hoping for on Mars. I'm hoping for 2022. I don't know. I think so. I, I would soon. hope so. I mean, I would hope it, so. It's soon, but you know, you need, you need to have. 23. You need to have that passion. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Mm. Hmm. I want to say like to be crazy next year, but I don't think that's going to happen. I would say. 2019, but I don't know. 
It could not happen, but it could happen. I don't know. I would say 2019, but it might be 2025. This is real. I'm not good at this. It's, hey, it's always good to be optimistic. There are no right or wrong answers, yeah. and I think the sooner the better. Tomorrow. So. Okay, no. yeah. <laughs> That would be pretty cool. That would be great. <laughs> um, we should film this show from the moon. That would be a show that I would Let's watch. Do it. Wait, I mean, I watch this show moon? too. But... <laughs> We're looking at Earth? No, this is, this is Planet X. It's not the Earth. It's a, no one knows what planet this is. It's Planet mm -hmm. X we're referring to it as. Uh, and, uh, Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> when, oh, we've had that question. Why space? Uh, because it's bigger than all of us. Yeah, mic drop. That's it. <laughs> it's bigger than all of us. It matters so much more. Uh, thank you, Athena. <laughs> now, before we go, where can people find out more information about you? Where can they find you on social and on the internet? Yeah, I made it very easy. Astro Athens, all one word. It's everything. It's my website, my YouTube, my Instagram, my Twitter, Tumblr. Uh, what else is it? Yeah, even my emails. Athena at Astro Athens. It's like mad easy. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. So we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll have comments from last, not last week, the week before's show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into comments from last fortnight's show, I'd love to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow. To our Escape Velocity patrons who give us $10 or more per episode, they get access to our exclusive Discord channel and they get their name in the show. But also we have our Orbital subscribers who give us $5 or more per episode. They get free worldwide shipping from our swag store and their name in the show as well. And also our sub Orbital members who give us $2.50 cents or more and they get access to After Dark as soon as it's available. And if you'd like to get your name in the show as well, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. So last show we had Jim Cantrell, who is the CEO of Vector Space Systems, and he was mm -hmm. telling us about the story of new space. So our first comment. Capcom? Um, oh, I am Capcom. <laughs> you are right? Capcom today, Capcom I suppose. Capcom today. Cool, cool. I, I like the name Capcom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our first comment comes off of Reddit. It's from Savaporo, and Savaporo says, Setting the record straight on the pad turnaround times, Vostok 3 and 4 were launched from the same pad in less than 24 hours. Soyuz 6, 7, and 8 were launched on three consecutive days using two pads. There are more examples of really rapid pad turnarounds for R7. Yeah, that R-7 launcher that the Soviet Union used during that time period was an absolutely fantastic launch vehicle because uh, it was able to still do that. Still using the, a version of it today. Yeah, still yeah. are, too. It's so good that, that uh, a very long time after its introduction, it's still being used. So, I think it's just really yeah. great that they can turn around so quickly, like 
all, all the work that's involved in because once you once you launch a rocket like it kind of destroys the pad a little bit doesn't it because of all the uh, a little stuff bit coming out. um a lot of the the infrastructure around the pad is designed to take the hit from a rocket launch um so um, but still, rapid turnaround at a, at a launch pad is a very difficult thing to accomplish. Because um, you have to make sure everything's good, everything's safe, and then you got to make sure everything's ready to go for another launch. And uh, that's complicated. Well, the so. dream is for that to happen, like, quick turnarounds all the time for every yes. launch. That's the dream. Yeah, just like airplanes. Yeah, so, exactly. Right? Yeah. Right? yeah. Launch Load airplane, it up, fuel land it. it, ready to go in another, like, two hours or something. Yeah, so, pretty yeah, cool. Make sure you... Uh, <laughs> clean out the toilet and that's make sure it's good to go for the yeah. next one. When round. it's sitting on the ground, it ain't making no money. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, it's very true. So. <laughs> cool. All right. Our next comment comes off of Reddit again from Gawilo Wizard. And Gawilo Wizard <laughs> says, you guys keep going on and on and on about planet Pluto. The planet Pluto. Do you also <laughs> consider Eris, Haumea, Make Make, and Ceres planets? The definition of a planet is, in the end, completely arbitrary, but it should be consistent. Mm-hmm. It should be. What yeah, do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I just want Pluto to be a planet because that's what I grew up with in school, mm -hmm. which was not that long ago for people who for... can tell how old I am. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just have this weird affinity for Pluto. And, like, there was this, like, gif that I saw once of, like, Pluto with the heart on it. And New Horizons is, like, coming past. And then it's all happy, but then New Horizons keeps going. And then Pluto gets all sad. And it mm. just, like, it's really humanized Pluto for me, and so I want it to be a planet because I think it's special. Mm -hmm. well, what about Eris and Haumea, Makemake, and Ceres? I guess should they be planets too? Well, I mean, they probably should, but I don't have that connection with them. Mm -hmm. But that might just be because we haven't sent a space probe there, so we should send, you know, a spacecraft to all of them, and then they can all be planets, and we can all feel connected to them. Mm -hmm. We've got to put a camera. And we on got there the one at like Ceres. Two. Yeah, we got Dawn at Ceres. Yeah. So. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, I've, I, especially when we've discovered them, I've always considered these planets. Like, the whole dwarf planet definition has never bothered me. And I don't know. I don't get it. I'm they're planets in my opinion. They're just dwarf planets. I'm fine with that. I acknowledge that they are small planets. They're mini planets. They're stodge-sized planets. Exactly. Yeah. One stodge <laughs> planet. <laughs> one stodge unit of planet. <laughs> so. And we need to explore each one. I mean, Ceres <laughs> was once a planet. So I don't see what the big deal is about reclassifying it as a planet. I mean, it was in 1801 when it got stripped of its planetary status, but but it's it's it doesn't seem like well, an a, it doesn't seem like an asteroid, which is what it was labeled for a very long time yeah. until the dwarf planet uh, um, definition came around. So that's good I, for Siri. It got I, an upgrade. I guess if there's if there's one if there's one thing um, that I would say as a qualifier as a planet, I'll just throw it out there, is, is that hydrostatic equilibrium basically enough mass to make you round? Um, I would say that's, a, that's one of the solid rules of the, the International Astronomical Union uh, planetary definition by astronomers, not planetary geologists. Whoops. Uh, so, yeah. So that's what, I, that's what I would keep in that rule. But really, we do need to be a little more consistent with the rules. So... Yeah, just choose oh, yeah. one, stop changing it, just keep it the same, and then everyone who's <laughs> going through the school system now can just stick with that, and they don't mm -hmm. have to worry about it being changed. So yeah. keep it consistent. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. All right, our next comment comes off of the Tomorrow website, and it's from Doug Space. Doug Space has written a lot here. So a here wall we, of text. wall of text. Here we go, I'm ready. <laughs> The key question for the moon is not whether it's a necessary step to Mars, but whether it is a legitimate destination for settlement in its own right. NASA's LCROSS mission shows that it is. If recycling, a person needs about a kilogram of volatiles a day. There are enough volatiles on the moon for a city of a million for about 1,600 years. And also, the LCROSS results show there is enough carbon and nitrogen if one recycles those as well. The moon is closer, safer, and cheaper than Mars as a legitimate destination for settlement in its own right. It therefore stands to reason that humanity's first permanent foothold should be established there. Boom. Yes. And I think that kind of sums up a, a, a good, the, the, the general consensus of tomorrow, I would say. Most of us are that moon first crowd, so. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's there's a good reason for sure. Yeah, I would even add on that it's not necessarily about the fact that there are the things that you need for a colony on the moon already there. Um, I I was talking with someone earlier this week about this, and that is we really don't know a lot actually about the moon. You know, we've been there, we've landed there, we've brought back samples and other things like that, but really the science of the moon is lacking in terms, especially in terms of, of instrumentation on the surface of the moon. So, um, so going back to the moon for me is not necessarily, um, uh, or being moon first is not necessarily just, it's closer, it's, it's easier to get back from a problem with and other things like that. There's also, to me, the additional uh, thing of the fact that there is so much science that has not been done at the moon that needs to be done in order to understand it. So, But it also, like, I mean, I'm all for going to the moon because there is all the science that we need to do. And yeah, there might be all the, you know, ingredients for life that we need, like uh, carbon and nitrogen there. But just because it's there doesn't mean it's easy to use it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we might have to extract it and process like lunar regolith mm -hmm. to be able to get usable stuff, usable components out of it. So if that's really hard to do, then that's going to add to the challenge as well. Yep. So. Just because it's there doesn't mean it's and readily I, available. And I'd even argue that even though it would be under different conditions, it would be just as hard to get those same sort of materials that we need to survive on other planets and other places in our solar system or even beyond that, you know, thousands of years from now. So I feel like if we want to have colonies on Mars and be able to have a sustainable, thriving civilization on other planets, we need to learn how to do that first. And I feel like the moon is a good place to practice how to doing that. I'm not so much concerned about setting up a permanent colony on the moon as I am proving that we can actually do it on the moon before we go places that help is not readily available. And even though, I mean, it's still, you know, depending on what type of rockets you have, it's still anywhere from a week to two week journey, it's still closer than a two to four year journey for, for Mars. So yeah. I feel like we need to practice how to survive and have some sort of sustainable, not even colony, even just a fort before we go on to these other places and do these ambitious things on other worlds. Yep. So that's just my opinion. That's a great point, Mike. Mm -hmm. So even if the stuff is hard to extract and use, it's better to have something that's hard to extract and use and learn from that at the moon than it is to go all the way to Mars and realize, oh, hey, we can't actually get the nutrients we need out of the, the regolith here. So mm -hmm. that's a great point. Yep. All oh, right, cool. our next comment comes off of YouTube. It's from our tourist P. All the moon or Mars talk. Why is no one ever talking about building a new space station with simulated gravity for deep space living? Is the idea too mm -hmm. sci-fi? As I understand, outer planet exploration is not possible without a thing like that. Please explain, somebody. Please explain. I'm going to look to Mike over there <laughs> since he's, uh, he's, he's very knowledgeable about things like this. Oh, man. So um, we definitely do need some sort of centrifuge, some sort of artificial gravity in order to enable the really deep exploration. We might be able to do Mars exploration missions. You know, We're really trying to find out and push the limits of how long the human body can withstand microgravity for. We've completed uh, the year-long mission now. We're going to have more year-long missions. And if we build the Deep Space Gateway, which it looks more and more like we are, there's going to be proving missions there. There's going to be a two-year mission in lunar orbit just to see if someone can withstand a two-year journey in that spacecraft to go to Mars. So we're testing all the time to see what we can stand. We probably will be able to stand a trip to Mars. But going out to the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, we're definitely going to need some sort of artificial gravity, even if we're not getting 1G. And we've looked at stuff like this in the past. There was supposed to be a centrifuge module that would be part of a habitation module set, sent up to the International Space Station, but that module got canceled. And one of my favorite concepts that didn't get picked up by NASA is a project called Nautilus X, which had a spinning centrifuge that would only have that section, that module of the ship would have that artificial gravity, but it would still be enough that during those long duration stays they could have, you know, partial gravity for a, a portion of their d duration of their time so we could enable deep space flight like that. But right now, since we have all of our human sights on going to the moon and going to Mars, and we're not really seriously looking at making the plans of going to human missions to, to moons of Jupiter or moons of Saturn or beyond, we aren't looking at those sort of things. But we definitely do need them. Either that or we need some sort of super medication to prevent all the degradation that happens within our bodies being exposed to microgravity for so long. And I think that I, sh I should end that there. But yeah, we definitely 
we definitely do need something like that. But until NASA or some other government agency or some sort of private organization or commercial company picks up artificial gravity and centrifuges or some other way of producing gravity somehow, it's not going to be done. And there's, I don't know, since we're not doing anything, nothing to talk about. But, but yeah, <laughs> until someone picks it up, it's, there's not much we can do. Yeah. Mike, what do you think is the bigger challenge, artificial gravity or radiation? Because Factor in the chat room asked that we don't have the tech for radiation yet for Mars or to go anywhere else. So, I mean, should we be looking at Well, sure at we do. It's just incredibly heavy. We have, the, we have the technology to protect ourselves from radiation. It's just incredibly heavy. And no one's going to be building a, a fully solid lead spacecraft anytime soon. So, um, and I know that's, that's a cheesy example. And, and the type of radiation that you'd be getting and gamma rays, you know, you, lead's not going to completely protect you. But I guess it's all about how heavy. We need to get the, innovate the technologies that can protect us from radiation and get it as light as possible so that we can do those types of journeys. Because even going to Mars, we're going to be exposed to extreme amounts of radiation. So I think that, that getting the weight down is a big challenge. But the problem with uh, the whole centrifuge idea is no one's actually done it before. Sure, we spin stabilize spacecraft all the time, but especially if we have one piece of a spacecraft that's spinning and the rest of it is stationary, yeah. we don't exactly know what the actual realistic effect of that would be because no one's tested it, not in space yet. So we don't know. So as far as I know, that might be the bigger challenge. In my mind, getting the weight down of radiation protection and having some sort of artificial gravity right now is an almost equal challenge until I learn more. So You know, artificial gravity has been tested on orbit. There were a couple of the Gemini missions that uh, attached a tether to the Agena upper stage and then actually did do like one one hundredth the gravitational pull of what we have here on the surface of the Earth. It had 0. 0.000018 so it was, it was G. Infinitesimal. <laughs> did a space pod on it. it Check it out. It was so small that the astronauts weren't really able to perceive it particularly well inside yep. of the capsule. But it is something that, that has been tested, I'll bet, maybe not as thoroughly um, as we need to to have that. So. It was like the things floating in the capsule were like, here's like a piece of yeah. like nail floating and it's just like very slow. You guys could see my hand moving, right? It's like tour going towards. Yeah, like that's, that's how fast it was We moving. did it. We did it. So you guys, you, this is in 4K. You'll see it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so. um, but they, they do oh, have... <laughs> A centrifuge on station right now that they can spin small things like animals, like mice and fruit flies <laughs> and stuff like that. But you know, maybe me, I'm pretty small. Um, stamps, you know. But yeah. Why did I find that funny? <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. Sure. All right. Our next comment Let's move on, though. comes from YouTube as well. It's from Satellite Zach Wadex. Woo. Zaquidex, there we go. And they say, I think the main reason for people choosing to go to Mars first is the inconsistency of the US political system. They figure that if we manage to get funding to go to Mars, it will be a stroke of luck, not something to expect or deserve. I think this basic hopelessness is pretty sad and something that should be addressed, even on such an optimistic show as yours. An extra reason would be that if they decide to defund the program while we are there, we could actually survive for a bit. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is a good point, defunding the program while you're there. It does, it does sound like something that would actually happen. Maybe so. that's why we need to like go to Mars and stay at Mars and not come back. And yeah, then that maybe. way, if the program loses funding, if you're already kind of self-reliant, then you don't have to worry so much. Yeah, space pirates. I don't know if I'd want to be on an early mission, though, that just so happened to take place uh, during an administration change. That would be very scary. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's one of the downsides to your political system, right, is that every time, you know, you get a new president or something, or, like, the majority in Congress changes from, like, one group to the other, then all your programs are kind of in jeopardy. Whereas at ESA, they fund programs, like, it, it, the, once you have funding for a specific program, you can't change that funding. So, like, say for Rosetta, everyone agreed to that funding, that funding stays through the whole program, even if, like, the political parties change and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And they planned out the entire lifetime of that program, yeah. that too. too. Okay, this yeah. is going to be a 30-year program. This is how much everyone's going to contribute to it, you yeah. know, and it's all agreed upon. Yeah, it's not, like, here where it seems like it goes from one contract point to the next contract yeah. point to yeah. the next contract point, and it doesn't necessarily fulfill the actual goal by getting to the next contract point, yep. you know. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, yeah. politics. Yeah. I mean, at least we don't have this well, That's why I guess I try to cover it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, <coughs> for now in Australia. For now, we might be so. getting a space agency. So, I mean, yeah. fingers crossed, we'll see how we go. Anyway, our next comment comes off of YouTube. It's from Rocky Boulders. I like that name, Rocky Boulders. Yeah, I Boulders, like that too. As opposed to non-Rocky Boulders. Yeah, as opposed to like porous boulders. Yeah. It's awesome to hear some of those neat little details that show how interconnected so many of the new space stories are. It would be really cool if you guys could interview more people working on the payloads that will be flying on these new launch systems. Very soon, it's going to be much more about what people are doing in space rather than how they're going to get there. Yeah, that's the cool thing of cost coming down. Yeah. Is that it opens up the realm of possibilities for what you can actually do in space. Maybe we can send more spinning things with centrifuges, spinning things other than mice. Yes. And then we can work on, you know, uh, simulating artificial gravity bigger and bigger and bigger until we can fit people inside or, or me. Even yeah. Either. Yeah. It's got to be big, yeah. big, though. You don't want to get sick. No, definitely so, not. Yeah. So, Mike, what really do you reckon? Uh, I think that that's a, a good idea and something that I've noticed lately is that there's a lot of people involved in the space industry who aren't necessarily like the, um, um, the passionate space fans that we are and you know they're just going for their day-to-day -day job. I recently the Iridium, uh, the, the satellite communication company has a headquarters here and I met some of the, one of the people that have worked there for like 10, 15 years and we were talking about the launches that they were having. This was a couple of months ago when the first 10 of their ne Iridium Next satellites were launching and just how cool it was and how awesome they thought the rocket was and that it, they were going to be trying to reuse it and just all these things that was getting them really fired up and they're just like I've been in this industry now for almost 15 years and it's only been recently that I've really appreciated how cool that this is. So I'm finding a lot more examples of that, of people who are already involved in the industry that are kind of more of just your everyday folks that are rediscovering what it is that they do and seeing the bigger picture. So I definitely agree with this comment that we should get more people who are working on payloads and stuff like that on the show. That would be great. I'm really looking forward to um, a group over in Europe that's working on growing plants in space and they'll, they're going to send up a satellite called Eucropus and there's going to be plants inside. I think they're tomato plants and they're going to have um, like the plants will be in a chamber in microgravity and they're being fed like ammonia rich water um, oh, Wow! and the ammonia is going to get broken down by a bacteria that they're putting in there mm. and so it's going to be like recycling nitrogen using bacteria to feed the plants and seeing if that actually works in microgravity, which will be really cool. Wow. That's a very That'll important really study, too. Yeah. So, yeah, oh my gosh. Recycling That's nitrogen so cool. wastes. I mean, right now on station, we recycle the astronauts' urine through, like, chemical means and mechanical means with the water filters up there. But if we could do it with plants and bacteria, I mean, then there's no waste that way. It's like closing the loop and closing the cycle. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So, like, you don't visit the toilet. No, you, on the, go to you the, just go to the go greenhouse to real quick. Yeah. So, gotcha. Yeah, closing, closing that loop, recycling. It's like camping. Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't usually do that when I'm camping. Excuse me, guys, fine. I'm going to go fertilize. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, those uh, plants are looking a bit wil that, no. wilted. Yeah, on that note, so. I think we're starting to wrap up here. So before we go, that was our last comment. Before we go today, I'd like to give a huge, huge thank you to our ground support patrons. These people give us... From $1 to $2.49 per show, they get their name in the show and access to our Google Hangouts whenever we do them. There should be one coming up soon because we haven't done one in a while. Yes. Um, and they get their name in the show. So if you would like Perfect. to help out tomorrow and fund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, that's all we have time for today. Next week, we have Adrian Times, the CEO of CubeCab. But right now, After Duck is up next, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yep. Bye-bye. See you guys.